Most of the time in practice we don't have just a single variable, so next we want to look at having n variables with n ODEs. We call the unknown dependent variables u1 to un, and the ODEs are given as dui dt equals a given function fi of t and all the variables. Each component also needs an initial value. A famous example is called the predator-prey system, or the Lotka-Volterra equations. Here, y and z represent the sizes of a prey species and a predator species. The prey species grows in the absence of predators, but interactions with predators decrease their growth rate. The predator species is in the opposite situation. If we label y and z as u1 and u2, then these become the functions f1 and f2. We can also gather the solution components into a vector u and write things as a single ODE with a vector valued function f and a vector initial condition. There is really no difference between a system of scalar ODEs and a vector ODE, and we use the terms pretty interchangeably. An important aspect of ODE systems is that higher-order derivatives in an ODE are always equivalent to higher dimension. This is easiest to explain by example. Here is the equation of a pendulum, where theta is the angle the pendulum makes with the vertical. We're given an initial angle and an initial angular velocity to specify the initial state of the system completely. Now we define a new vector variable by setting u1 equal to theta and u2 equal to theta prime. We can replace all the references to the theta in these equations by references to u as follows. By the definition of u1, we have that du1 dt is theta prime. And by the definition of theta2, we have that du dt is theta double prime. Looking back at the original ODE, we can isolate theta double prime and use it to rewrite du2 dt in terms of theta and theta prime only. Then we go back once more to the definitions of u1 and u2 and use them to make substitutions that remove all the remaining theta references. Now everything that's underlined composes a vector ODE that uses only u and not theta. Finally, we have to go back to the initial values and replace those as well by references to u only. Altogether, we have a two-dimensional first-order vector initial value problem in place of our original scalar second-order problem. Here I have a second order ODE in the variable theta. Uh, this is the equation of a pendulum 
Many times you'll see this with a theta here instead of sine theta because it's linear, but this is more accurate for large angles. With time derivatives, we often use a dot to represent the derivative. So here I'm rewriting the equation where theta double dot is a function of everything else. And that's because to solve this problem, I'm going to have to recast it as a first order system in two variables. So a second order equation gives me two variables, and those variables are theta and theta dot. So the angular position and the angular velocity. Here's the function that implements the ODE. So as always, we have a function of t and u, two variables. u is a vector valued var variable that holds the two components of the solution. So the function is able to get values for u, that's theta and theta dot. Given those two values, it needs to return the value of the derivative of u with respect to time. Well, the first component is theta, and by definition, d theta dt is equal to the theta dot value. The other equation is the derivative of theta dot, but that's the same as theta double dot, and that's given by the ODE. So we have minus gamma times theta dot minus sine theta. So given a value for u, I've computed these two components for du dt, and the last thing to do is to just package them back up so that I return them as a vector. So here's how we use it. f is that function which defines the ODE. The initial value is a vector with two components. The first component is theta, the second is theta dot, so we start at a large angle of two and a half radians and a zero initial angular velocity. And here are the times that I want the output at, so 2001 different times. And finally, the fourth line solves the thing. You see it's very fast despite having so many points. The output here, u, each column represents one of the two variables in the system. So the first column is theta, the second column is theta dot. Each row represents a different value of time, so the rows here match up with the rows here. So that means the first column is all of theta as a function of time. So that's what I pull out here, and then I can plot that plot theta as a function of time, and you see oscillation with an exponential decay. The second column of u has the angular velocity, theta dot, so I can use that to make a phase plane plot. I put theta on the x-axis and theta dot on the y-axis, and you see this spiraling behavior as the solution decays. Here's a larger example of converting higher derivatives to higher dimensions. I'm writing out a system with three variables, x, y, z, and equations of second and third order. This system needs seven initial conditions to specify the solution uniquely. It always happens that the quantities given in the initial values make the correct definitions for the new vector variable. According to these definitions, we have du1 dt is x prime, du2 dt is x double prime, du3 dt is y prime, du4 dt is y double prime, du5 dt is y triple prime, and so on for z. Now we look down this whole list for the highest derivative present in each variable. Each one of these appears in one of the original ODEs, and we can use those to substitute for the high derivatives below. Then we're able to translate each of the OD functions into the U variables.
At the end of this process, we'll have no more references to the original x, y, and z variables, and we have a complete system of seven ODEs instead. Here's a look at the book's implementation of Euler's method for systems of equations or for vector equations. As always, we're given the function that defines the ODE, the time interval that we're solving over, the initial value, which in this case will be a vector, and the number of steps that we want to take. The outputs are a vector of the times that we're giving the solution at, and then in this case it'll be an array or a matrix of solution values at those times. To begin with, we set things up in time, so we find the grid spacing, and then we define the whole vector of times in one shot, like this. Then we get the output array set up, so we'll let m be the dimension of the system, that's the length of the solution vector. So you will have m rows for the different components of the solution, and n plus 1 columns for the different times. So each column of this u corresponds to the solution at one time. And we start things off with the initial value. So I put that in the first column of u. This little syntax here is to turn u0 into a column vector in case it was given as a row. So here's the real iteration, the real Euler's method part of it. We simply refer to the vector solution at time i. We call the time derivative function at ti and with that vector ui. Multiply that, so that must be a vector result. We multiply that by h and add it to ui and we get the next value of the solution. So that's all quite straightforward. Then this last bit just makes the shape of u correspond to what MATLAB does. So MATLAB puts different time values in different rows. We put them in different columns. So this just takes the transpose so that the output comes out the same.